Today, the alpha spectrometer is being calibrated. Especially the energy calibration needs to be done before each measurement, otherwise you won't be able to draw useful results from your spectrum. For this, we need a calibration sample. In this case, it's an three element alpha source consisting of americium-241, curium-244 and neptunium-237. On the back side, we can see the active material onto which these elements were electrochemically deposited. For the calibration, the alpha source is inserted into the second slot. A vacuum is drawn and it's measured for 5 minutes, then again in the 5th and once more in the 10th slot. It's customary to energy calibrate not on the peak as with the gammas, but on the right inflection point due to the tailing in the low energy range. I perform the energy calibration in the 2nd slot. Now pay attention to both axis dimensions. Here we see neptunium-237 with an alpha energy of 4788 volts, which decays into productinium-233 with a half-life of 2.1 million years. Americium-241 decays with an alpha energy of 5486 volts and a half-life of 432 years to neptunium-237. Curium-244 decays with an alpha energy of 5805 volts to plutonium-240. As a trend, it's noticeable that nuclei with shorter half-lives exhibit a higher alpha energy. Now regarding efficiency calibration, it's quite similar to the Geely's efficiency in gamma spectrometry. Initially, the theoretical activity on the measurement day must be determined again using the decay equation. We need to know that the neptunium activity on December 12, 1996 was 150 becquerel. Using this, the half-life and the seconds elapsed since September until today, July 7, 2023. We plug it in and surprise, surprise, the activity has hardly changed. Who would have guessed with a half-life of 2.1 million years? Also to consider is the occurrence probability of the 4,790 kilo electron volt alphas from neptunium. After calculating the activity for all three elements and measuring the activity for all three nuclei via the region of interest and then dividing this by the theoretical activity and the efficiency for the second slot is approximately 17%. Unlike with the Geely, we don't have a energy dependent efficiency. However, when comparing the measurement results from the other slots, we notice a trend. The further away, the lower the efficiency. This is not really due to the detector, but to the so-called geometric factor. Since we had a platform on the Geely where the distance remains the same, this was negligible in the efficiency calibration for the Geely. The geometric factor can be illustrated like this. For almost all our radioactive sources in the lab, we consider them to be point sources. So a tiny radioactive sphere emitting isotropically meaning radiating equally in all directions. So we've measured our alpha sources at three different distances. Keep in mind the actual activity of the source remains the same, but as it emits in all directions at increasing distances with the same detector size, it's more likely that an alpha particle passes by the detector and not hitting it. This relationship between distance and measured radioactivity is quadratic. At distance A, the first detector plate measures, let's say, 9 particles. At distance 2A, it only measures 2.25 particles. And at 3A distance, it only measures 1 particle, to express that somewhat mathematically. Therefore, we observe an efficiency drop from 17 to 2%. In summary, the larger the distance from the radioactive point source, the lower the amount of radiation received. This relationship is not linear, but quadratic, which is quite important. From now on, we can measure perfect alpha spectrum, right? A special thanks goes to the Working Group of Analytics and Fundamental Nuclear Chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the Division of Nuclear Chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, goodbye.